Mais. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by Funkinsliff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the First Guide of Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching the video version of this at Funkinstuff.net or on YouTube or listening to the audio-only podcast version from providers like iTunes and Spotify. As always, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in the show. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. All kinds of goodies you'll get uh, early premieres and it's all free. So make sure you sign up, tell a friend, tell family. Also get your official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff gear at the funkandstuff.net store. Cool stuff like I'm wearing right here, Truth and Rhythm shirts, Show your support and love of the show and also the musicians and the music that they represent. I um, also want to give a shout out to the Funk Exhibition Center and Hall of Fame in Dayton, Ohio, of which I'm very proud to be an official Funk Ambassador. Go to thefunkcenter.org to learn more and keep the funk alive. And now, with all that, it's time to get on with the show. Enjoy. I am pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership Ivan Neville, a prolific keyboardist, singer, and composer, and a member of New Orleans' celebrated musical family, the Nevilles. Recording professionally since the early 1980s, Ivan has released four solo albums and been one of the industry's busiest session players. Among those whose records he has appeared on, and in many cases performed with, are The Rolling Stones, Keith Richards, Bonnie Raitt, Dr. John, Government Mule, Buddy Guy, Jerry Lee Lewis, Angie Stone, Phoebe Snow, Paula Abdul, Don Henley, Robbie Robertson, Rufus, The Spin Doctors, Stevie Salas, and so many more. He is also the leader of Dumpsta Funk, one of the funkiest bands to emerge this millennium. Since 2003, the group has scorched concert stages, grinding out a mix of original tracks along with blistering renditions of funk rock classics by the likes of Grand Central Station, Betty Davis, Led Zeppelin, The Meters, Mother's Finest, Parliament Funkadelic Mandrill, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and many more. Woo, that is impressive. And so, I welcome Ivan Neville to the Truth and Rhythm Show. Ivan, how are you? How you doing, man? It's great to see you. Thanks for yeah, joining the too. show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I know you've had a little bit of a rough patch. Uh, how are you feeling? And do you want to talk about that just a little bit? Well, today, today is actually a pretty decent day. Um, yeah, as you might know that I, I did, I had tested positive for the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus thing. And I started feeling those symptoms in mid-March. Um, I had a pretty little, pretty, you know, pretty uh, rough go of it for a minute. I had like, bad, really, you know, pretty uh, bad fever for close to two weeks. No appetite. I didn't have many of the other symptoms, but I did get the... The, the breathing compromised breathing later on like after my fever had gone away and i was able to eat i started feeling this breathing um restrictions and whatnot <clears throat> and basically i i found out that i had, had i had pneumonia as well to so we'll go you know the, the, the covid pneumonia which is uh is kind of just makes it basically linger on longer the effects of it and um, so this one, this was like, like I, I think March uh, the 15th was when I first uh, started experiencing the symptoms. And um, so the pneumonia kind of, like I say, makes it linger a little longer. Funny thing was I tried to get tested twice. And this should be known. People should know about this. 
this lack of this this uh, talk of tests for everyone. And, and uh, I, t- I went to get tested twice, and they wouldn't test me because my when I they took my temperature, my temperature was normal at those particular times. But obviously, having fever, you will take Tylenol because you don't want to be burning up. You don't want to be 102. Fever had gotten up as high as 103. And so twice I got turned down for the test. I, I assumed that they had limited on the tests, and they only wanted to test people that, that showed obvious or severe symptoms. I didn't look like I was about to die, so they did not give me a test. I was tested finally, and I came back positive. And... Um, <clears throat> which I just assumed I had it. So I just kind of act as if until I found out that I was positive. And then, you know, you just do things. And, I st- and w- then when I started getting the breathing complications, I was I read up about it, about how your lungs react and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and it, basically everything I read or from every, everybody I talked to, they said, get your lungs working. I started doing breathing exercises. I started going for walks you know, go up and down the steps at my house to go downstairs and put the laundry and stuff like that, just doing stuff. Get active and show your lungs how, to, how they're supposed to act again. Because they know, but they've temporarily forgotten. This thing has come in there and it's kind of trying to compromise your lungs. Mm-hmm. And and so the, the lung, that thing, that, that lingered on for a while. And then finally, my breathing got better. <clears throat> take a deep breath and now I can I can take a pretty good deep breath now. And also the good news is I was tested again on Friday and I got news today that it came back negative. Uh-huh. So I, I guess I survived the COVID-19 and um, I, as soon as they told me that I was negative, it, it was like a weight was lifted. It was like physically and mentally immediately. I just felt better mm-hmm. because that's another, there's a mental aspect to it. The anxiety, of knowing that you have this or possibly have this and knowing some of the other um, unfortunate uh, results. A lot of people have died and things of that, you know, stuff like that. So you start thinking about stuff like that and your mental, it's like a mental warfare because you're like, when you start feeling a little bit better and then one day, the next day, you're not feeling so hot. So then you're kind of, okay, I don't want to jump for joy just yet even though it's been long enough, seemingly, because it's been like seven weeks for me. And I had, like I say, I had the pneumonia, so that could make it linger longer. And I also, I didn't find out what my last, latest chest, chest x-ray said exactly. The doctor's going to call me later and tell me, but from what the nurse told me, if he hadn't called you by now, no news is good news. That means you're probably pretty, pretty good. And um, so I'm happy about that. So... Yeah, I can't, when Ivan's going to get back to 100% at some point, hopefully, because it's possible that your lung may have a little something damaged for long term. So I, I can live with that, and I could just work on it and get it back better. I can still sing a little bit, which makes me ha- happy. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate right there. But that, yeah. So I'm in a good mood today. <laughs> Well, thank thank God that uh, yeah. you know the news worked out that way. So yeah. very glad to hear that, and yeah. also you know encouragement for others who may you know come down with it. So yeah, the thing about it is you gotta you because it it tells you in your mind and how physic how you feel physically. It tells you to lay there. It tells you you got the worst flu you've ever imagined. You have no appetite. You got fever, and depending on the symptoms, aches, and all of this stuff, you want to just lay in the fetal position and just. Hope, hope it goes away. But at some point, if you get any strength whatsoever, you got to get up and you got to walk around. You got to breathe. You got to start deep, taking deep breaths and trying and finding out about some breathing ex- exercises and things of that nature. And maybe that will definitely help you to get back. So, that, and man, yeah, what an ordeal. I tell yeah. You. And, and you probably got it. I understand you were uh, part of one of the last concerts in New York. <laughs> yeah, I ain't going to say that. Yeah, that's my that's my people, and it's a great organization. And at the time, we didn't know what we found out a week later. You know, this was the a matter of fact. The night before we were playing this show, everybody was everybody knew. I mean, we had you know everybody knew that this thing was upon us, but we didn't know what we were to later find out because that the night before this this show happened, the NBA shut its operation down. 
And they were the first ones to really, the first big organization to shut down. And that, they made a big statement when they did that. When they did that, that made a lot of other people take a look and say, okay, if the NBA shut down its full operation, uh, all you know, no, no games, the season right now is suspended until further notice. Mm-hmm. And so then people started chiming in about gatherings of less than of so many. You can only have a gathering of so many people. And at that time, they had only whittled it down in New York to 500 or less, you know. And we were playing a show that fits maybe 2,500 to 3,000 people. And so they turned it into just friends and family of the crew and the people who were performing. And they were going to stream the show. And that's what they did. Long story short, was a, a few, a few, several people that were at this event. And we were all, you know, fist pumping and elbowing and nobody was shaking hands. And people were kind of standoffish. But we weren't practicing what we found out a little while, about a week or so later social distancing not even a week that like that when i got by the time i got home which was the friday of the march the 13th and i didn't really know i was sick yet i felt a little odd i thought but i didn't really and i didn't want to be sick obviously but by the time um uh, we, we we pulled out the, the thermometer at our house and said okay let's see what's going on <laughs> with all of us because we started hearing more and more about it and I had fever and it's like okay I moved to the back of the house I moved to the back isolated but by I think by that time it had already you know probably got because uh you know other people in the house got got it as well Mm. and handled it a lot better than me I must tell you because I was like a little uh you know I was pretty pretty wimpy in the in the back room like oh poor me I'm so so devastated and so weak <laughs> and the boss the boss lady of the house was you know walking around doing taking care of the house doing everything and going through and and, and they she, they were she had symptoms as well but you know we pushed through and I, I'm, I'm glad to come out on the other side of it so yeah yeah glad to have you on the other yeah, side yeah 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 uh, let's talk a little bit about your incredible musical heritage and then work our way up to some dumpster fun so um you know, what was it like growing up as part of that, you know, musical royalty of New Orleans, the Neville family, and 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 how did you first get in into you know deep into music yourself? Well, um, first of all, it was it was it was pretty fun um, as a kid watching, seeing um, my dad, my uncles. I knew they were all musicians, and it's in some. To, to some degree, they were all in, into music, and um, and and you know, I, my dad had other jobs. He had some odd jobs here and there in my during my childhood because he hadn't quite, you know, become uh, uh, you know financially successful yet. Like early in the early in the game, back in the days, it, you know, guys had other jobs and stuff that they did on the side to make sure their family had enough food to eat and things of that nature. So, you know, and I knew, I knew that he was a musician. I knew he, he was first and foremost a singer and a musician. And I, I remember when him doing the, like other side jobs, it was like, wow, you know, he's doing, you know, I, and I, I thought of, I mean, even, even then it hit me as, okay, he's doing what he's got to do because I know he really wants to sing. And, and I, my uncle Art, who lived right down the street from us, you know, uh, these guys, it was amazing that we lived close, close by each other. We were, our, our whole family, like my dad's side of the family, like my grandmother, my, my, the, the Neville brothers, mom, my grandmother, Amelia, Amelia Landry Neville lived a block away from us. And my uncle Art lived, uh, across the street from her. And so we were always kind of just close and there was always, let alone those guys being musicians and 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 uh exposing us to the the people that they were affiliated with which i'll talk about in a minute but also the music the mute the love for music that was expressed by everybody by my grandmother by my mom my you know everybody and it was it was amazing and then in new orleans just has a thing about it you know that's just so musical and so so rich with, with that the love for that and the culture um 
And obviously later on, as I, when I was about 15 years old, it was when I kind of started playing a little bit of piano. My dad showed me a little bit. And this guy by the name of James Booker, uh, one of the most amazing piano players that I've ever heard in my life. Um, and I'm sure if you heard him, you would say the same thing, anybody. James Booker was a childhood friend. He went to grade school with my dad. He went to high school with my mom. So he used to stop by our house every so often, like once every couple years or something, Booker would show up. A couple times, no, maybe a couple times a year. A couple times a year, he would show up unannounced. Oh, there's Booker. And he, he, and he would sit down at the piano and just go playing, and he would play some stuff like you've never heard. He would take some Beethoven, some, you know, some classical pieces, and then he would turn it into some boogie-woogie stuff. He was amazing. And then... Seeing that, I was absolutely in awe, and and then knowing that my dad could play a little bit of piano, he played a little bit, and he showed me a song like. That was one of the first songs that he showed me how to play. It's called Cabbage Alley, and that was a tune that my Uncle Art had recorded with his band, The Meters. And uh, that was a take on a Professor Longhair song that was called Hey Now Baby. Um, so, yeah, this, so this, this definitely inspired me. And then I started playing around a little bit and I started singing. I, I kind of knew I, I was musically inclined before that, but I really kind of got into it a little bit. And I was in high school at this time. By the time I was in like 11th grade, I really was trying to do, do music. And I, was, I played at a concert at school with the stage band. And the reaction that it that I got from you know everybody it was in a, in a school <laughs> auditorium, you know, it was like, oh wow, this is cool. Um, yeah, uh, those things really you know kind of catapulted me into the idea of wanting to maybe be a musician. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is this is cool. I wouldn't mind doing this. And then I realized that I maybe had a little bit of talent, and I, if I pursued it, I could possibly do it. And shortly thereafter, my dad and them started the Neville Brothers band around 1978 and I by 79 I was playing with them I was I was I went on tours with them and yeah how old were you then I was probably um 20 19 20 21 somewhere around up in there yeah wow and yeah 19 19 and yeah because I played my first gig at the Tipitina's I hadn't quite made made 18 yet. I was like 17, and I had to get a permit. Hmm. I had to get a permit uh, to go in the club. I, maybe I was I, was I 18 and you had to be 21 or something like that. I don't, I'm not. I wasn't 18 yet, and yeah, I had to get a permit. It was yeah, it was fun stuff. Were you always uh, confident in your singing early on? Also, no, nah, I was never confident in any of that crap. To believe, <laughs> I tell you the truth, I was never confident in my playing or singing. And I'm still questionable, questioning myself all the time. Um, I always think I could do a little bit better. Um, but I felt like I was I was good. I thought I could do a little. I thought I was okay. You know, I figured, you know what? I would hear people sing and hear records and hear artists that were making it and that were successful. And I say, well, I could maybe sing just as good as that person, or play me. You know, I, I think I could do this. So there, there was some confidence. There was some confidence. Yeah. What kind of music, aside from, you know, like the meters or whatnot, were you mostly attracted to? I was attracted to a lot of stuff, man. Because as an, at, at an early age, I'm talking before, I'm talking about six years old. I was, I was, I loved the Beatles. I loved the Stones, all that stuff. There was a guy by the name of Larry Williams, who was a friend of my dad's, who wrote some songs that the Beatles recorded. He wrote, slow down, come on, pretty baby, won't you talk with me? Come on, pretty baby, won't you walk with me? That song, slow down, baby, know you're moving way too fast. That was Larry Williams, and he, he I, I dug his stuff. And then later on, I mean, I just liked, I just liked a lot of stuff, man. And, and the way the radio was during those times, at the, I'm talking the mid to the late 60s to the early 70s, man, to me was the greatest era of music to me and it was like a lot of soul music a lot of some funk rock stuff Sly and the Family Stone the Jackson 5 um, everything from Elton John Benny and the Jets 
to um the spinners. I mean, I like Rufus and Shaka Khan tell me something good, all that stuff, man. There was so much music was so uh, there was such a variety of stuff and, and, and nothing was there were no the boundaries were, you know, uh, limitless seemingly back then because you would hear music that would come on the radio and it would be like it didn't sound like anything you had heard up to that point. Mm-hmm. Which later on everybody was trying to sound like each other. You know what I'm saying? All the records you would you would hear people trying to make, you needed to sound like something else that was popular. Right. So, you know, you went on to play you with like you needed to sound like something else. Yeah. You went on to play with like so many, you know, big artists, big and small. And, um, you know, we don't have time to go into all of them, but I definitely want to hit on a couple. And I want to know, how did you end up, you know, connecting with Keith Richards and the Rolling Stones and that whole thing? <clears throat> OK, so that's that's a cool story. And, and, and the funny thing was I had just I had I had been playing with Bonnie Raitt who was um, um, uh, one of my favorite, like when I, people ask me, who have you played with? It's one of the favorite people. I, I, I mean, that's one of my favorites to, to mention. I played with Bonnie Ray. Um, <clears throat> I had been playing with her for a few years from like 84 to like 87, it was 86, something like that. Maybe two, almost three years maybe. And I was in, New- I ended up in New York. And I think it was at the end of a Bonnie tour. And the, um, now, wait a minute, I got to go. I got to back up because the initial Stones connection was made when the meters opened up for the Rolling Stones in 1975. Okay. The meters opened up for the Stones in 75, maybe 75, 76, somewhere around then. Then the Neville brothers opened up for the Stones in 81 on the Tattoo You tour. And I was a part of that. I was playing with the brothers at the time. So I met them during those days. And then I happened to be in New York after a, a touring with Bonnie Raitt for a while. I met must have been 1986, 80, somewhere around there. Um, and the, the Stones were working on this uh, album called Dirty Work. Mm-hmm. And I ended up going over to the studio. A friend of mine, a guy by the name of Rob Favoni, Rob knew that the Stones were recording. And he said, oh, Ivan, let's go over to, to the Stones uh, recording session. And so we ended up going over to the session and I ended up uh, hitting it off with Keith and Ronnie Wood. And I ended up going back to the studio on several occasions. I went to, the, to their sessions for like three, four times <clears throat> during that week. <clears throat> and um, um, yeah, so that was my initial like real connection with Keith. Like we, we hit it off. And then soon after that, maybe... So I ended up playing bass on a song on Dirty Work on that record. I played on a song called Hold Back. Hmm. I played bass, um, which was a, which was to me was a thrill, was totally amazing. That's the first record I had ever played on bass, other than my own demos and songwriting. I had never played bass on somebody's record. The Rolling Stones. Wow. <laughs> so that was that was fascinating. And then Keith decided to. I was working on my first record. If my ancestors could see me now. And this was around 1987, and Keith, I got a call from from Keith that he was wanted to play with play with a few people, and he was putting together something for a, a solo thing he was working on. And I was one of the people that he called, and we ended up making that first record, "Talk Is Cheap," <clears throat> with Keith and myself, Keith, um, Steve Jordan, Waddy Wattel, Charlie Drayton. That we became this band called the Expensive Winos, mm-hmm. and we back Keith. We played with Keith um, on the Talk Is Cheap record, and we did another record called Main Offender, and another live recording that's I, I heard that's supposed to be remastered and released this fall. It's called, it was called the Expensive Winos live at the Hollywood Palladium. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. They they redid that um, Talk Is Cheap in a nice package not too long ago too. Yeah, they did that. Yeah, yeah. I got I got I got one. Um, well, a lot of questions coming out of that, Ivan. Um, you know, I had, uh, uh, Neil, um, Nocentelli was on the show and he mentioned that was like his biggest thrill was opening for the Stones in 75, um, with the meters and, um, that Tattoo You tour, I saw that at the LA Coliseum in 81, but the Neville brothers weren't on that particular one. It was when Prince got booed off the stage. I heard about that. Yeah. Well, we played. We played at the. 
in Chicago at the Rosemont Horizon and that uh, some place in Louisville, Kentucky. I don't remember what the name of that place was. And we played it, opened up for them at the Superdome in New Orleans. Wow. So we did like three shows, 1981. Yeah. And there was a couple of parties, a couple of after things or pre. I missed a couple of cool hangs. I think there's a, I saw they, they went in when we were in Chicago. I think they went and hung out to Checkerboard Lounge. And they went and jammed with, um, I think, with Muddy Waters and those guys. I think I missed out on that one. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw that you played with them, but I'm not sure if you were at this show, Nickel Bag with Steve Salas. I was at the Key Club show in Los Angeles, and I got backstage, and that was the only time I ever met Keith Richards. He was backstage at that show. Oh, Nickel Bag, yeah, with, with Stevie and yeah. you Noah Fowler and, and them guys, yeah. I wasn't at that one. That was at the Key Club. Yeah, I think I missed that. Yeah, yeah, that was. I cool. knew, but those, those those guys were good friends of mine as well. Stevie Salas and Bernard Fowler. Yeah, my man Bernard. Yeah. So, what can you tell us? Do you have one story maybe to tell about uh, Keith or the Rolling Stones? Uh, Emilio uh, Castillo from Tower of Power was on. He had a a crazy Keith Richards story, but I'm sure there must be uh, something you can share with us. Um, uh, let me see. I got, I got a bunch. <laughs> so a lot of mine are kind of dark. <laughs> uh, let me see. Yeah, I got, I got some that were, I was pretty inebriated and you know, yeah, it was pretty, pretty funny. Um, I fell asleep one time at Giant Stadium. I was supposed to sit in with the Stones, but that's one of my stories. <laughs> <laughs> that was before I got clean and sober. I was pretty lit and I fell asleep at Giant Stadium. I was supposed to go sit in and play with the Stones. I passed out in the dressing room and uh, missed the show. But uh, not Keith. Keith is a, you know, what? he's a he's a character, man. That guy, I, I, I was around him a whole lot. And I, what, I'm going to tell you what I, I don't have, I, I, there's a few little, like, um, I guess a few legendary Keith stories. But what I really want to say about him is that he, that guy, that guy, uh, He's all about the music, man. He's all about, he's very intelligent, very intelligent guy, very intelligent, very well, well spoken. He reads a lot. Um, he's not, what people think of him, his, the, the myth and the legend. I mean, he, he, he's Keith. He is Keith. And he's lived through some, you know, some stuff that a lot of people maybe wouldn't make it through some of the things that he's lived through. But, you know, I mean, obviously we had, we parted, we, you know, we did our share of, you know, um, re recreational things back in the days. But I mean, he was a guy that would play a riff. Now I'm gonna take you. We we would. I remember we we were in the studio working on to take it so hard record, and that that intro. That dude, we played that riff for so long. And he and Jordan, see, he liked to play uh, a riff with a, with a drummer, just he and the drummer. So imagine the songs that were written with Keith and Charlie playing together before the rest of the group kind of gotten in, in, in the swing of that. He and the drummer would, would, you know, would bang it out. And there were times when we would play a riff like a long time, like hours. We would play the same thing. And... To where you would be like, okay, we still playing this, and then you know we were, you know, we were doing some recreational things, like I said back then. I was, I can't speak for anybody else, but I, I was, <laughs> and um, you know, it get to a point where you're playing. I'm like, okay, I need a break. I need to go do a sniff or something. I don't know. Let's say we've been playing this thing for like two two hours or something. When are we gonna get? When are we gonna get to where we got the tune down? And then, you know, and then at some point, some magic, like with that particular song, the funny thing was we played that song for a long time and Charlie Drayton and Steve Jordan switched and Drayton got on drums and Jordan got on bass. And I believe we played it twice. The second take, I believe, was the one that was that record. Hmm. And it's one of those magical things. I mean, in those riffs, imagine all of those Stones riffs. Imagine how long they would probably share that. Imagine him and Charlie Watts just 
banging that out for like an hour, two hours, an hour and a half. You know what I'm saying? Before it's a, before it became an actual song. Yeah. It could be, you know, you could be like at some point, like, okay, we playing this again and we're hearing this again. But then when it, the magic of it, when it turns into what it becomes, this iconic song, where the not only the the song, the words, and what you what you're singing, but the riff is just as much as an as an anthem as what you're saying, and that's the magic of that guy. His riff master. Riff, is as, is as powerful as any big chanting chorus on a song. That riff is what you're like, oh my God. It's, uh, it's my, mind blowing. I'm, I'm really honored that I, you know, that, I'm, that I've got to play with him and, and can call him a friend. You know, I really, I'm really honored about that. Did, um, did you get a chance to play with or meet Bernie Worrell or Bootsy at all? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah. I, uh, well, when we were making that Keith record, I wasn't, I wasn't with them when they recorded the Bootsy and Bernie stuff. But, which was amazing, by the way. A lot of people ask me about the Talk Is Cheap record. I only played on maybe five or six songs on that record, and the rest of it was done with different f configurations. It was mostly Keith. Jordan Waddy and some was Bernie Worrell was on a lot of it and Bootsy was on a couple of things. They had Buckwheat, Stanley Buck, uh, Buckwheat from Buckwheat Zydeco on some squeeze box, uh, accordion and stuff. Maceo was on some stuff. They had some, you know, they had some folks on, on, on some of that stuff. And I got to really meet Bernie later on. And unfortunately for me, there's a couple of pictures of me and Bernie, like the last time I saw him, which was the year before the last jazz festival, he came down to New Orleans and, and it was, he, I think he passed, he passed away like right not too long after that. And there's some pictures of he and I playing keyboards and me standing behind him while he plays. We, he sat in with the meters, um, my uncle Art and, and Zigaboo George and Leo, and I was playing keyboards as well backing up my uncle art and bernie was there and bernie came and sat in and, and and yeah there's some beautiful pictures of me standing behind bernie just watching him yeah I, he called me he called me neff hey neff where an uncle you know <laughs> he was like i was like his nephew and i, I love that because he was such an inspiration to me and his playing on all the records that he played on with paul and funkadelic all that stuff and um Bootsy, I, I, you know what? I, I never really got to play with Bootsy, but I've met him on several occasions, and <clears throat> and it was, yeah, he's he's a bad dude. He's the dude played on Sex Machine with James Brown. So, I mean, come on, that's that's, that's legendary, you know. He he's, he traces the whole deal from that yeah, all the way through yeah. George and yeah, his own that's stuff. So, yeah, yeah, that's some funk pedigree right there. Yeah. 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 Um, so. Are there any other keyboard players besides like a Bernie Worrell? I'm sure was influential to you. Who, who are a couple of others that you really look up to? Um, there's a few. There's a few that are probably not not really obvious. And and I I like the keyboard stuff that Sly Sly did Sly Stone. He he had some subtle gospel funk thing going on with his approach. Stevie Wonder. He I mean you know he he's a master of of, of everything. I mean that cat. Um, uh, Herbie Hancock. Obviously, I can't play like that, but Herbie, man, uh, he, just listening to that to, to what he does, he's done all, all these years, and and there's some new cats. I'm gonna say new, but some recent guys that I'm in awe when I hear them play. This cat, this kid, uh, this cat, Corey Henry. He's a bad young dude, man. He can play his behind off. And there's some other guys that I've heard over the recent years that I really love the way they play. Neil Evans from Soul Live, mm -hmm. um, a couple of others. Um, Nigel Hall, um, great player. John Cleary. John Cleary came. He moved to New Orleans from where? From England, and he picked up uh, the Professor Longhair, Alan Tuss. Your audio just dropped. School. Your your audio's dropped out. Well, he 
you kind of went and school. Did it? Is it back now? Back now? Huh. Yeah, you're back now. Is it, it, okay. Wow. John, like I said, John Cleary um, is a guy that he came came from England, came to New Orleans and soaked it all up, and he took some of that Professor Long Allen Toussaint uh, stuff and 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 did did a little thing with it, and he's amazing. Um, yeah, there's some guys, man. There's some cats out there doing it, you know. So jump forward to 2003. Uh, Dumpster Funk was sort of created on a lark almost, right? You were just trying to get something together for the Jazz Fest, right? And yeah, yeah. We wanted to get together and play a gig. Uh, it was an Ivan Neville solo gig at the fairgrounds at the Jazz and Heritage Festival. And I'm like, let me put something different together. I wanted to put something uh together that wasn't just a band backing me up. And so I said, let me call some friends and I called my little cousin Ian and I called, and I'm like, I don't know which bass player to call, Nick Daniels or Tony Hall. And I thought to myself, you know what, I'm gonna call both of them. And I did, and um, and Raymond Weber, and he was the original dumpster funk drummer. And we, hey, there was a few others that were on that initial gig. Some horn players from the Dirty Dozen Brass Band were on that gig too. And Junior Yamagichi, and also my little brother, my little brother uh, Aaron Junior. We called him Fred, and that was their first Dumpster Funk um, show. That was called Dumpster Funk. Ivan Neville and Dumpster Funk. <clears throat> and it was called Ivan Neville's Dumpster Funk. That's what it was called at first. And then we we only played like some part time, every now and again shows. It was it was a side band, you know. And, um, so I think around after Katrina, around 06, we started playing a few festivals. We got offers to play, we played Bonnaroo in 06. And that was our first big, um, like, step out gig that wasn't really got took notice. And we played Bonnaroo, and then we played the, the Jam Cruise the following year. And then we got on a few festivals, the High Sierra Festival, and uh, a couple of these other ones that was what was it called? Uh, ten thousand was it? Ten thousand lakes uh, festival up in Minnesota. Uh, yeah, we played a, a few of these marquee festivals that were going at the time, and that kind of put us on the map. And we started, we became a part time, I mean a full time band around, I would say, oh seven, two thousand and seven. And and how did you come up with the name? I, you know what? Actually, that name came from <clears throat> we we were. Me and my, my two brothers, my two younger brothers, we were trying, we were working on some music one time and I was trying to think of something, of a song, or something funky. And I'm like, what's something really funky? What's funky? And I thought to myself, a dumpster. A dumpster is nasty. So I thought, dumpster funk. It kind of stuck. And that, that be, that's how it became the name of, that, of the band. And he came up with the unique spelling and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dumpster funk with a PH. <laughs> um, stop, boom, yeah. What do you remember? Like what the set list was like on that first show? I uh, had a few songs. We had a song called "Ugly Truth" that was an Ivan song that we can incorporate two bases. There was a song that was written by Zigaboo from the Meters called "Standing in Your Stuff." That that bass line was a bass line that Nick had kind of helped come up with, and so that was a two bass song. A couple of those and um. A song called Scrape that was on my record that was called Scrape, the title song from that, that record. Um that was I remember those in particular. <clears throat> but you you had done, you know, as you mentioned earlier, like some solo records. And <clears throat> how how did you uh how did you want this to be different from your solo stuff? With the dumpster stuff? Yeah. I just wanted it to be more, more, I wanted it to be a band and not just my vision completely. I wanted the input, equal input from everybody. And we all just kind of a true co collaboration. And that's kind of where, where, where we went with it. Well, you know, when I became aware of the band was probably like right around the time when you got into it full time. So, that's, right? you know, going yeah. on 15 years already. Uh, yeah, it's been but, that long. Wow. But man, as a as a long time lifelong, you know, funk lover. I mean, when I heard it, 
I was immediately blown away because it sounded so authentic. It sounded so deep. And you guys would do covers, you know, of stuff like Temptations or P-Funk or yeah. whatever. And, I mean, it sounded as good as the source material. And not a lot of bands can, can do that or say that. So... Yeah, well, we we tried to when we tried to we tried to pay we tried to pay respect, uh, pay reverence to um, to the to, to that music that we love. And when we cover stuff, we try to either stay true to what it was and try to make it our own a little bit, without um, being uh, blasphemous. You know what I'm saying? Because some stuff I feel like okay, I don't want to cover that because that original version is just too good. You, you can't yeah, you can't do that any better. So why mess with it? But then we did a weird, we did a cover that we I came up with an arrangement for a song, and it was a, uh, it was um actually sympathy for the devil. We did a weird cover of that back in the days, and it had a thing, and that was just, that's a song that I kind of yeah, I wouldn't mess with that, but we did, you know um. We did a few of those, but you know, we like to pick some odd stuff every now and again and come up with some. We have a song that we're gonna it's gonna come out as a single in the near future. It's, it's a Buddy Miles song. It's called United Nations Stump. <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty talking about everybody coming together, trying to trying to um, you know let's, uh, living as one basically. Everybody come together, uh, uh, put aside your differences. You know, uh, we got more in common than we, you know, we have more, more in common than we, than we are different, you know. Um, so uh, we kind of, that's what it's talking about. It's called United Nations Stomp. Well, I think you guys, among the other things, let's go to <clears throat> some of the other artists you've covered. But in that same vein, I know you guys have done One Nation Under a Groove also, which is kind of a similar sentiment to, uh, to that yeah. one. But yeah, we've um, done that one, yeah. You've yeah. done a Grand Central Station, uh, Betty Davis, Walter. Led... Led Zeppelin, yeah. Yeah, Mother's Finest, <laughs> Mandrill, Red Hot Chili Peppers, so many stuff. others. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now we enjoy doing, paying tribute to, to the other music that we like, you know, and, and maybe making it, dumpstifying it, you know. And uh, to Tony, I mean, he really brings it too on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Great vocals that complement yours yeah. so well too. <clears throat> no, nah, the, the combination of myself. Tony and Nick singing is, is, is nothing like it. Man. Yeah. So how would you say that, you know, the groups evolved uh, from then till now? Um, I mean, we've obviously, uh, we know each other very well and we, we knew each other from the get go. I mean, we all known each other for a long time, but I mean, obviously we, you know, we've grown musically individually and we, we you know, I think we've learned to just, we know each other very well. So, I mean, I would say we've grown in that way, even when you, like, um, knowing how to do this, how to create, make a puzzle, and how to not play, knowing when, when, knowing when to not play, you know? And we're trying to grow, grow as um, collaborative songwriters when you're writing a song as a group, and that's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but uh, we've grown in that, in that area. Which, which people will find out when they hear some of the new material that we've, got, that we've been working on. So, yeah. So you've, you've had two studio albums so far, right? Three, I believe. Three. Three? Listen here. Everybody wants some in Dirty Word. <clears throat> yeah, it's funny. You were on Dirty Work and Dirty Word. Dirty, wor dirty Word. You know? I know, I'm saying, though. You were on both yeah, of them. right, right, right. <laughs> Wanted to ask you about uh, one or two of your most unforgettable uh, performance memories. I mean, I, I have down here that I know, um, you know, you did a, a big gig that had members of the dead there. And I heard you did one also with Tower of Power and what, with Blackbird McKnight from P-Funk. And... Right. I would say my two most memorable ones with Dumpster Funk was opening up for the Rolling Stones in the Superdome. That was just last year. That's one of, that was one, that was a, one of the most fun gigs I ever played. Also, yeah. our collaboration with the, with the Tower Power was amazing. That was something, yeah, that was exciting. And it was everything you would think that it would be, it was. And then when we did a whole tour with George Clinton, Paul and the Funkadelic, that was fun as well. 
And then we had a couple of collabs with the Foundation of Funk and members of the Dead, uh, uh, comp- Dead and Company. That was pretty awesome. Um, yeah, with Bobby Weir and, and John Mayer and Mickey and, and Billy. Billy, uh, that was killing. That was killing. And with Dumpster Funk did a show one time with Bob Weir. We did two shows with him that were pretty fun. Uh, one at Sweetwater in Mill Valley, and one was at the Great American Music Hall, man, that was, that was something. And I know you've done a lot of uh, charitable <clears throat> work and performances, and I wanted to just get from you, you know, why, why is that important to you, Ivan? Well, you know what, you're fortunate that you get to play a little music as, as you to make a living, and um, if you have any chance to give back, it's a good thing, you know, and then you have organizations that help keep people going and help people keep, uh, help, help, help keep some folks alive, you know, and one of my favorites is the New Orleans Musicians Clinic, because musicians, um, for the most part, that I know about uh, most of my peers and a lot of guys, a lot, and a lot of the guys that are less fortunate, that don't have the luxury of traveling around and doing this, that have... There's not a, a great health care situation for musicians. Um, we don't have the, I mean, uh, the, we have the musicians union, but we haven't put enough into it to make it worth something and, and give good health care for musicians. So a lot of musicians don't have health insurance, you know. Um, so the, uh, an organization like the New Orleans Musicians Clinic is amazing. And also Music Cares, Music Cares, uh, the Grammy Foundation, they do amazing work. They've helped me over the years. I mean, early on when I was trying to get clean and sober, I got help from them. That's fantastic, all that work you do. So kudos to you for that, Ivan. And um, how can, uh, you know, I, I noticed you're doing these uh, piano uh, performances periodically on Facebook and trying to keep in touch with people <clears throat> while we're in this lockdown situation. Um, how can people keep up with you? Uh, you go to Facebook, Ivan Neville Facebook page. I have my personal page. I also have an Ivan Neville fan page and the Dumpster Funk Facebook page and also Instagram. All of those are on Instagram. Well, Dumpster Funk and I, am, and I have an Ivan Neville Instagram. And that's usually where you find out what things are going on. I don't even know about it. There's a Dumpster Funk website that maybe have some information, but mostly we're more, more proactive now with the Facebook and the Instagram. Outstanding. Hey, I'm so glad, you know, to talk to you. I'm so glad that you're doing a lot better and look forward to so much more great music. Thank you very much, man. Thanks for thanks for inviting me to to, to, to share some stories and have a little chat. Appreciate it. Until the next time, right. you take good care of yourself. Thank you, man. You too. Okay. All right. Thanks. God bless. Bye. You too, man. Later. Thanks. Hey, back at Truth and Rhythm headquarters. Thank you for joining us on another magical ride with Truth and Rhythm. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Be sure to subscribe. Go to YouTube. Go to the Funkin' Stuff channel. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes and thrives. Also, goodies here like TIR Quick Takes. And if you subscribe, you know what? You get the show before anyone else. It's free. If you love jazz, funk, R&B, soul, you can't miss it. Pass it along. Tell a friend. Tell family. This audience is growing, and it is a beautiful thing, all coming together for the love of this great music. Also, if you can throw us a buck or two, we could use the support financially, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers going, all these expenses. If you can help support the program, whatever you can give, much appreciated. Go to the funkinstuff.net website. And on the right-hand side of every page, you just click and you can donate through PayPal, credit card, whatever. Very easy to do and so much appreciated. And if you do a sizable donation, I will mention you on the program. Also, drop me a line. Email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you enjoy about the music. Let's just kibitz. And uh, talk about stuff, you know, talk music. You'll find that I respond very quickly, and I much enjoy the uh, rapport and the camaraderie and the interaction. Always remember, this is your show, The True Music Lover. 
So for now, that's all the time we have for this one. It's a wrap. As always, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.